could stay up with without any conviction Broke my own heart this time For believing that a ghost could find the body alive That hasn't seen the other side So don't call me, I'll find something to escape Happy Monday, everybody. Yo ho. Hey. Last day of November here. Yeah, wow. That's man, up. time time flies when you're uh still contesting an election. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh yeah, man. Crazy. Crazy to think that, that was that was the I feel like this month definitely like blurred by. Like this this was uh uh so many things leading up to November 2020 that uh, uh, it, I think it, it just kind of like disappeared into the uh, into the ether. Yeah. Election? No, we did that months ago. Exactly right. I mean, it, it is it is hilarious to to think of things that happened in January and February, and you're like, that's you know, happy. Like I, I was, I actually had a tweet that I was gonna like set an alarm to be like, happy ten year anniversary to the Super Bowl that happened in January or February, <laughs> like when when it rolls around next year. Nobody is sitting here going, oh, it's almost December. Hard to believe the year's almost over. Nobody's saying that now. You know, no. nobody's going, my time flies by fast. It's like this year's just been. I know. And it's nuts because this is always kind of the blow off year or blow off month in any year. Right. People are taking vacations yeah. and they're traveling and they're doing holiday stuff and they're they're burning vacation days. And so it's like, what does the blow off month look like on the blow off? year <laughs> like everything's <laughs> crazy everything's insane uh, uh i don't know i feel like we could all just stand to hit the fast forward button to christmas and then uh shortly thereafter new year's yeah let's just get let's just let's just jump right to 2022 <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's just, just, yeah this is hibernation be great. <laughs> we should have like our own hands across america but it's just as many people as possible doing the wrap it up side to the year 2020 yeah. <laughs> yeah. just a lot of a lot of this going yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah do you guys even remember um man i remember everybody saying like yeah good riddance 2019 2020 let's uh, it's gonna be better like i can't even remember what su was supposed to be bad from last celebrities year. were dying celebrities were dying back in, and that's what, like it was like oh no prince died worst year ever uh, uh and never was like this is oh can't wait to get done with this crappy year and then i mean i'll tell you i'm not gonna wish ill on anybody but if if if, if the old gods are real and all we have to do is sacrifice a few celebrities to keep the wolves at bay <laughs> i'm willing to begin negotiations <laughs> That's how it starts. That's how it starts. That's how you start a blood cult. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's how that's how Leah Thompson dies. <laughs> oh god. Uh hey everybody. Uh how goes it? Uh you guys want to do some weird things? Yeah, ready to rock. Yeah, ma'am. Andrew? Yeah, he's I think he's getting he's got some new equipment over there, so I think he's uh He's fiddling. Uh, he's, he's fiddling. He's, he's fiddling. And we now uh -oh. we cannot hear nope. him. So nope, cannot hear him. Yeah, he knows that. Yeah, there you go. He's fiddling. Uh, but you don't need you, you don't need audio to tell he's got a new camera and he's looking really nice. He does look good. He's looking nice today. Exactly. But what rich tones? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know you really you really get uh, the lifelike sense of uh, the bushy mane, yeah. the big teeth. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's it's a maybe a, a moth. Maybe yeah, a moth. it may in fact be a moth. My producer Tara Gates <laughs> is telling me. 
It's a camera. It's a camera. It's the horse teeth effect. All right. It's not me. The new Snapchat filter. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You uh, you about ready to start, Andrew? One second. Uh, okay. so my throat's got to dry. <laughs> Uh, it's the tears, Bryce. They oh, just oh, dehydrate me. Oh, sorry. All right, I'll count you in here. In three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. I'm a Santa hat guy now. For podcast listeners, I'm going to be wearing a Santa hat for as much as this season as possible. I don't know why. It's just happening. Go with it. Mr. Brian Brushwood. I'd like to believe there's no deadline to ever take it off. I mean, it'll be cute in January. Bit of a bit of a head scratcher in February. <laughs> come come March, uh, you'll just be the Santa hat guy forever. Here. I think, yeah. There's there's that fine line between eccentricity, which will be allowed for about six weeks, at which point it becomes a lifestyle. I mean, we've found uh you know what? We could just track how long the HOA let us keep a dragon on our front lawn. <laughs> Was it a uh, God? Was it like Penn and Teller who talked about like the parrot guy? You know, the the guy that wears puts the parrot on their shoulder. Oh, you I know, don't, I don't to, think I know this story. It's just just sort of the kind of the, the guy, the guy that just sort of like you know has the parrot goes over the parrot, so people talk to him, you know, because they've got the parrot, you know, there, and like you know, I, yeah. There, there, the there was a dude. Of. There was a dude who. Uh, would uh, uh, always go to this bar that me and a few friends of mine would would frequent, and he was always outside, and he always had a parrot on his shoulder, and he always, exactly in the same way that Andrew's describing, a dude that assuredly had problems kind of like making conversation or being the center of attention that now was wearing a parrot. And I'll tell you what, initially when you walk up, you're like, that's a parrot, man. I have a lot of, co- I have a lot of questions about parrots. And then at some point, he would always be up against a wall, at some point, he would have to move from that wall, and you would see lines of caked-on bird poop that immediately robbed you of any desire to speak to this man <laughs> ever. Like, it was really a double-edged sword. So I think it was a story from one of their books they did, but, uh, man, I just Googled the parrot guy, and I regret it. Ha <laughs> ha uh oh geez louise what is this <laughs> oh this is this is a, a, body, a human modification. body art yeah yeah a guy who's doing body modification to make himself look like a parrot i don't think yeah. he's being very successful in most of these shots um no it looks like it looks like a colorful form of grayscale it does yeah he he, he looks like uh the kind of prosthesis that would be found in early '90s WCW. Like this is, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, they're 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 trying to catch up to the Undertaker, and now they have their own colorful version instead of the monochromatic. And he jobs the Hulk Hogan, and we never see him again. Yeah. So moving right along. <laughs> so hey, man, I thought this cool. was a podcast about weird things, not boring body modification of exactly. people who want to become human well, parents. And, and also, it's like, if you want to become a human parent and you're body modificating, then, then feathers? I would I would, I would have went with feathers. I would have went with some kind of synthetic feather situation. Also, to, uh, to, to be fair, we've made up everything that we've said about this person. We don't get to start criticizing him on his technique, considering that we literally made up his story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess so. All right. So moving on, really exciting news from the field of artificial intelligence and medicine. One of the biggest projects that's been going on or one of the biggest areas of research in computation has been protein folding. Years ago, there was the Project Fold at Home, which was a whole program where people were using their own computer systems tied into a big network to try to solve protein sequences Protein folding is a big issue because you take this big, long strain of protein, and the way it folds affects everything from, you know, it's how our bodies are formed, our cells are made, drug interactions, and all of this, and trying to predict and understand what this stretched out protein actually looks like in a three-dimensional space is a super critical problem that we want to solve for developing new kinds of therapies, et cetera, into the future. And there have been efforts to try to measure the improvement 
uh, how accurate we've been able to do it in the past and improve that over time. And today, uh, DeepMind, which is part of Alphabet, you know, the, the Google portfolio companies, announced that they've set a big new benchmark for protein folding with AlphaFold, which is a system that has been, they've used this before, and now they've made a big improvement on, you know, the algorithms behind that. And have done uh, looking at like the success rate in it. There's a chart which you can go see if you go to the Deep Mind. Actually, there's an older article, but there should be a newer one which would go into and show you that like this is like a 15 percent or like 20 percent increase. I think. Wow. Uh, and and so this this is uh, uh, it's not necessarily less computation, but but with the with the more horsepower, it is doing so much greater things than than we had seen with previous uh, versions of it well and, and you know figuring out more efficient you know more efficient yeah. ways to do this because that's part of with you know this is deep mind which did alpha go and alpha go zero which were the systems are able to win it go and then this alpha go zero was the one that taught itself how to play go and been able to set world records for this so if we go look at the the most recent press release for this it's, it's funny because it's been indexed here um it's a pretty big deal. It's a pretty big, you know, it looks like it, from what they're saying, a pretty significant leap forward with this. So I, I understand the importance for quality modeling of, you know, three-dimensional space of a protein. And, and in my imagination, this is uh, me expressing my ignorance, um, I, I assume that this would help to inform best guesses as to how different things will interact or whatever. But but what is the boots? Do, do we know... Does anybody on the panel, <laughs> I'm going to throw it to everybody, uh, know, know what the boots on the ground effects look like in terms of um, what we do exactly with that knowledge? Does does this help to narrow down like candidates for things or or is there help help walk me through this? So think about think about like when you look at how like a virus plugs into a cell and you know about receptors and stuff and you understand there's a shape to receptors okay and understanding the shape can tell you what kind of virus can affect it with proteins when it wraps itself up into its structure certain parts of it are exposed certain parts of it aren't and so when you know what the exposed parts are you understand how it will interact with other proteins and other molecules and that's kind of what it is is once you can see it you can go like oh I think I know what fits here. I think I know what's exposed here. I think I know what's being active or what's not active. And so it's kind of like just figuring out, you know, if you're trying to build a drug or build something and you want to know, you know, what is the structure of how this applies to what what's going to lock onto that, what's not. Got it. So right now we're seeing a model of of exactly what, Bryce? Uh uh, uh folding <laughs> okay okay yeah um, <laughs> dr mario this is a graphic this is not I, this, I, uh this video shows parts of a simulation run on folding at home oh, I of see. a protein okay. where atoms are move aside exposing a site where a drug can bind got it so so uh got it so so in other words it's a case where everything is so knotted that that we we uh, literally have to tear it open to find the binding receptors right and then figuring yeah. out, so from there, you can better develop drugs and, and they can be more effective and have fewer side effects. And, and this is like a, a, a gigantic step forward in terms of uh, making those things more effective. Someone and in our you chat. Have, you have, can, go ahead. Oh, someone in our chat uh, clarifies, folding calculations allow scientists to determine where interfaces exist for, say, an Ebola vaccine to neutralize an Ebola virus. Got it. So it, it's... Uh, not with... That would be a cellular interaction wow. on the surface. So, man. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, yeah, you wouldn't really want to try to directly affect a protein in that way. That would be a cellular interaction, which is the surface of that. But, and you might, anyhow, uh, sort of. So, like, think about like, uh, Two, like you talk about like, like uh, certain diseases and conditions are because you're, 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 you have malformed proteins. Okay. So, for instance, if you're having a malformed protein, how do you how do you spot it? What do you know? And you can saw, oh, in this little sequence here, this is shape it. So the shape of this is very different, you know. And so you can look at it and say, like, you know, like a thing, like you know, you know, certain diseases, like, uh, for instance, if somebody has, you know, like eczema or something like that, you know, 
then all of a sudden you're able to look at this and say, okay, uh, this protein's misformed in this person because at some stage it's not being produced in the right way. How do you really tell? Protein folding sort of shows you like, wow, this is shaped completely different than what it should be. Very cool. And and so you you were saying that uh, an increase, in, did you say 20% uh, increase in speed? Oh. Uh, sorry, we have lost your audio, Andrew. Justin, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. And we can hear you, Justin. For, yeah, for whatever reason, okay. we, we lost Andrew here. Let me let him. No, no. No, no. Mm. We'll, we'll just pause here and see. Uh, give him a sec. In fact, I'm going to take this second to go and flip a switch really quick. Go. You flip that switch. What switch got flipped? We'll find out. Okay. All right. Let's see. Hello. Hello. Andrew, can you hear us? Uh, okay. We still cannot hear you, though. Hmm. Um, can Have you tried simply uh, just reconnecting, disconnecting, reconnecting the elbow? Yeah. Um, uh, Hmm. Let's see. Uh, maybe. I mean, we can we can just restart your PC, and see if that, uh, or your computer, and see if if maybe that. that yeah, I know. Oh wait, I'm hearing clicking. Hello. I see the opal thing moving hey! up and down. Hey, we can hear you now. Can you hear us? Yeah, I hear you. Uh, yeah, I would say I would. The the solution I go for before restarting the PC is to go look in the opal settings because it keeps adding microphones. Mm, I see. Oh. Okay. Uh, well, good. Uh, good to know. I think uh, we can we can pick it up. So, uh, Brian, you were asking uh, oh, about the, the percentage here. I, I'll find yeah. it again. Like, <clears throat> uh, uh, and forget. Did you say a 20% increase of speed? How, how big a difference? Um, so I think there's a chart there, and I don't want to speak, uh, you know, out of turn here, but I think, oh, there we go. Like, you can see that the previous one with records was set by AlphaFold was just shy of 60%, uh, and this has moved up to, like, about almost a 90% increase. So this looks like, you know, significant increase over the from two years ago. Uh, yeah, I don't know what the GDT is, but, but basically, uh, picture a bunch of forties in a line and then a 60 in a bar chart and then an over 80. <laughs> so almost a 90 of whatever those units are. It's, and, yeah. and I suppose, I suppose this speaks to, it's, it's hard for everyone to get excited. Like, like, I mean, I, I, I do grasp numbers are going higher and that's good for science to solve things faster. Uh, but then, but then, but then you get into the the way the models work and all that stuff, and then and then the, you know what what we tangibly get. Man, explaining science in less than a headline uh, is hard. <laughs> I know it. Re it really shows you how much like you know science educators like are a really really important part of this to to be able to kind of uh, 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 lay stuff like this out is is really really important before we get to the like tangible results which are going to become their own sort of headline yeah and and just to our what i've been suggesting the chat and to clarify that is that when you're looking at the protein sequences of viruses which is they're suggesting you can look at this use this to analyze a protein sequence of viruses and figure out how to attack that um i was thinking literally about the human protein sequences which is why i you know said did a nah and then i'm like oh no that's actually right so <laughs> to clarify, uh, that's one of the big things is we look at these viruses and we're trying to figure out, you know, they're made of proteins too, and how do they function? What do they look like? And we're able to use these sequencing to be able to do at it, you know, to look at that gives you a really big insight. How will it come into play? You know, where are we going to be able to look at this um, to figure out, you know, how are we going to be able to you know, put this to use? You know, we, we've already been using our ability to look at proteins you know, to try to do treatments initially, you know, already, you know, we've used crystallography, et cetera, 
you know, to try to figure this out. So, you know, we will see. And um, as being pointed out by the uh, the ever clever tally is, yeah, not all viruses have protein coding. Some of our strictly just RNA or DNA, and it's not a thing that's going to be a solve everything kind of thing, but it might solve. There's a lot, there's a whole host of conditions getting even away from, you know, things involving viruses just within your own body and how it produces proteins that then try to solve functions. So it's a very, very... Man, the, the potentially very exciting. The problem I want to solve is how am I going to buy Christmas presents this year? Well, Brian, uh, you're not. And you're going to have to explain to everybody in your life, including your family, that you won't have money to do so. Unless people head on over to patreon.com slash weird things right now. Support this show. Uh, uh, we technically count as a small business, so please go ahead and support your local small business by pledging on patreon.com slash weird things. There, you will be able to get a, a, a custom RSS feed where you get the show early. You get the uh, After Things podcast as well. So uh, head on over there right now. Patreon.com slash weird things. Sometimes there are stories that come out that might as well be like tagged. Duh, this is going to be on weird things. And so, and I often sometimes just sort of want to like, ah, do we really want to do that? Cause it's so obvious and on the nose. Then it's like, uh, probably we should do them because we are weird things and not, not trying to be on the nose. I mean, I or, swear the headline better be something like Bigfoot turned out to be made of spiders uh, or goblins. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, did you follow the story of the mysterious monolith that showed up in the Utah desert? Oh, we we yes. briefly noted it. Yeah, uh, I I my immediate reaction was pure skepticism. In that, um, uh, the way everyone is is presenting it is that it just appeared and nobody knows where it came from. And and my skepticism was not that there's a monolith in the Utah desert, but that my skepticism was that there's no way it was just found and that some awesome artist just put it out and and hoped someday it would get found. Uh, do do we know more about the story? Well, apparently it had shown up on like Google, uh, like Google images for it's been there for a couple of years. So it may have been a thing that had been waiting to be found. The the eerie thing was, of course, as you watch the video and you get like the like the Bureau of Land Management, whatever, this helicopter crew where they're all dressed in their flight suits. And it looks like a scene out of like a behind the scenes of some sci fi movie because these guys you know, yeah. look like Planet of the Apes. Right, they all, they all have, they all, they, they, the flight suits really do sell it. I mean, it looks plus also if you think of that iconic scene of the monolith on the moon being dug out in 2001, it looks like that because it's in a canyon. You've got these high walls on all sides. You have this thing right in the middle of it. So it looked, you know, it's cool and mysterious. And then people like, ooh, I wonder why it's there. It's like if this showed up in downtown Austin, nobody would care. Right, it, it would not be a big deal, but because it's out there in the middle of the desert, it's like, ooh, it's out there in the in fact, desert. Because I, I, uh, I would say that the the funniest meme that I saw of it came from uh, uh, the the southwestern uh, Southwest Airlines official Twitter account that just said sorry, and it was just these the monolith, which is all metallic, and it just had their boarding numbers on it. If you've ever taken a Southwest <laughs> flight <laughs> where you're standing like <laughs> before or or after these markers. Uh uh but but yeah, you know, it was it was it's something that obviously was staged to look awesome in the place that they did. They was very fortunate that it was found by people that wanted to take really cool pictures of it and video of it uh, to Andrew's point. It is certainly enhanced by the fact that it looks like an unnamed government agency is uh, uh, interacting with this alien artifact, but uh, uh, it's not something that if it was in SF or Austin or LA, anybody would blink twice. Yeah. Uh so, but but I, I suppose my my affection is um and and I guess E. Clay Thompson in the chat is saying like I see rivets guys come on like I don't think anybody literally anywhere is claiming that this is of extraterrestrial origin. Um, my skepticism is whether or not some crazy artist truly just put something out there because it deserves to be beautiful and didn't really care if it ever got discovered or not. And there are people who have done stuff like that, but those are rare and wonderful unicorns. What I feared it was, was a coordinated, yeah, we'll put this thing out, then we'll bust out the cameras, then we'll pretend to discover it. And yeah. then we'll, you know, like that, it, that's the cynical part of and it. And then everyone will know that the new Shake Shack 
super fries are here and they come in a metallic uh, uh, obelisk. Exactly. Exactly. I'm okay. I'm on board for all of that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so they they decided not to let the location be known because they say it's in a very remote area. And one of the things they hate doing is having to rescue tourists who get lost in very remote areas. And so uh, they said, hey, we're not telling you the location, but apparently it's gone now. What? I mean that that seems uh, so, like a pretty easy thing to do if you uh, if you have uh, easy easy is the wrong word um s simple and easy uh, s simple and difficult aren't necessarily yes yeah, somebody did do that Brian uh, what well, yeah I mean it's fairly simple you come up with a helicopter and fly away with it all you need is a little thing called money uh but but yeah wild or an all terrain vehicle uh so the the, the location wasn't known officially but some people were able to look at the maps compare it whatever and find it and then the claim is that uh it's got, supposedly gone now but very you know i wonder did the artist go back there and get it or did somebody or or is this a heist did somebody figure could be, could be a heist oh you know it'd be great is if quite literally a government crew said hey there's garbage somebody left very big very pretty garbage here can you come clean it up and so a government garbage group like yeah i guess we got it and so now we have a literal government conspiracy in which government agents came and retrieved the strange artifact okay all right i want to ask yeah this government garbage group brian i want you to tell us some of the other yeah. scenarios they've been involved in i mean let's say let's say a weather balloon crashed outside of roswell i mean somebody's got to okay. clean that garbage up <laughs> okay that's actually a great like 90s uh grant morrison comic idea <laughs> like just the idea of like like the garbage men and they're just like this like slightly darker version of men in black that are are, are just getting into these seedier uh, it's, uh it, it, interactions between society and aliens it's like a mundane version of marvel's uh was it damage control the the group that comes in and cleans up after the, every superhero battle yep. yeah <laughs> yeah that's uh they end up kind of like the beginning of Spider-Man Homecoming. Oh, that's right. You know, yeah, after that's the right. Battle of New York, all of this sort of stuff, this alien tech, everything that's left over. And that's what I loved about, yeah, that's what I thought the Marvel is at its best, where they sort of stop and go, well, what is this world really like? And yeah. they're like, oh, yeah, somebody's got to clean this stuff up. And those weapons could be useful. Rather than having to invent a whole new hero out of or bad guy out of nowhere, you're like, Oh, what did this problem? What complications did this create? And you yeah, know, the, the government garbage men. So, any other that's scenarios? That's we the can way think to about go. This? Uh, like, uh, go ahead. I, I got one for you, which would be a great documentary. Okay. All right. After King Kong fell, who was responsible? For taking care of the body oh my god it, it, hopefully it would be great is if they decided like the whale thing that we're gonna try detonating <laughs> the corpse gonna... of this giant 60 foot tall ape but it's but it's all like in the same time period right so it's like it's all like you know the like comical bundled dynamite and and you know a guy with a mustache with a big plunger <laughs> like <laughs> All the, the round bombs with the little few. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they get somebody right, high everybody. stepping in. Light light your fuses with your torches uh, uh, thusly. Wait, wait. I want to buy some monkey meat first. <laughs> uh, uh, somebody's selling uh, uh, cut your own tuft of history before it's gone. <laughs> it's like Dude. Oh, you rent shears. They run up. They grab a handful of, of, of uh, ape fur. That would make an amazing pseudo documentary like after Kong <laughs> fell of like, what did New Yorkers do with the body of Kong? Where did his skull end up? Like what was, you know, did people just pour over it, tear him it apart would actually and humiliate be, him even further? It'd be great if it was kind of like Shaun of the Dead style, like mainly a, a relationship documentary that just sort of, or, or that just is set at the backdrop of what do you do with this gigantic yeah. uh, ape corpse? <laughs> Wow, has anyone uh, has anyone done a zombie Kong? 
where like you just combine a zombie story where it's like Kong dies and it's like, oh, it was beauty that felled the beast. And then a zombie just runs up and bites him. (laughs) 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 And and it's just a little tiny, like a mosquito bite. And they're like, oh, no, oh, no, get it, get it out. You're like, oh, I'm pretty sure we got there in time. The movie ends with eye opening. Bloodshot (laughs) eyes. Zombie (laughs) Kong is now just... (laughs) <laughs> available now on amazon zombie kong big bad heavy hungry from james roy delay the man that brought you the highly successful best new zombie tales comes to the most original zombie anthology of all time uh in jungles in the arctic in cities and towns zombie kong rules them all <laughs> nice all right good 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 for that man that's a great idea God, I can't uh, wait until until AI gets smart enough for me to just, uh, it, 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 like, I don't care how low fidelity it is, just, uh, you know, we're already at the point where it can kind of spit out a script with a little bit of guidance, but then just, I just want to be able to feed that script into a rendering engine and then just have it, and then, you know, have it understand the loose structure of, of, of scene changes and stuff. And it's like, I'll buckle in for that, for that 20 minute masterpiece. <laughs> yeah. Uh, someday, maybe soon. But need need to see that other people have thought about that idea too, though. That is Zombie Kong. Um, Zombie Kong, twenty twelve, awesome. Temporarily I just, out I of do stock want the Ken on Burns, Amazon, unfortunately. Well, I want the Ken Burns slow moving images of Kong, and then talking about the different you know people <laughs> who showed up and claimed the body of Kong, and the pipe fitters one hundred and one and whatnot, because yeah. they realized the value there. You know, the, oh, the yeah. hand ended up in a... Or, or it's like, uh, um, uh, there was so much blood in the Kong body that they had to hire these plumbers. And it's like, yeah, I ain't never seen that. There's there's more gallons than two Olympic-sized swimming pools. That's 64,000 gallons of blood. We had to run a special pipe that sent it all into the East River. <laughs> yeah. the here's, Smithsonian here's the mayor turning the spigot <laughs> the, the Kong blood spigot oh my god how many times is the mayor like <laughs> smashing a bottle of champagne or cutting a ribbon because of some Kong related public up. works project <laughs> Oh, you know what? After seven years of cleanup, we kind of miss the old guy. And thus, Kong Park was designed. <laughs> it would be in the shape of his fallen body, but filled with trees. <laughs> I think we have a story there. I think we do. Uh, I think we do. Got one more, one more story here to talk about. Um Speaking of zombies, this is a story where everybody who writes the headline knows the headline is wrong, but they want to write the headline because they can't stop themselves from doing that. Yep. And I'm talking about dead minks rising from the dead. Dead minks rising from the dead. Wait, what? See, now, Brian, you, you heard you heard of these minks, huh? Right? These minks, these animals, the minks. Like, like the fur coat? Yeah, like the yeah. All right, so okay. you know how uh, people are alive or they're dead. Yeah. These are these ones are dead. Yeah, except but, they're not. Boom, gotcha, bro. So I, back I, from the so dead. I, I believe you're describing a throwaway scene from the original Ghostbusters. Isn't that a scene? <laughs> like, is. isn't so that quite literally? <laughs> so Denmark uh, realized that there's certain animals that can be you know can carry disease uh like carry coronavirus and can particular minks so they decided to like like mass kill minks like just kill off all like the mink population right um because it turned out that some people had been infected by a mutated strain that had been passed to them from humans and minks and whatnot living together so 17 million minks were gassed and buried in trenches in a military zone in western denmark the bodies were buried under two meters of soil, but the problem was is the little poor minks started to swell and expand and push through the soil, and minks started coming to the surface. How, uh, if if we don't mind going in chronological order, how does one find themselves in a position to kill seventeen million? Uh, minks like like that seems well, like these a... are on farms they're in cages oh, got it. okay okay yeah they're being raised for yeah. for got it okay i thought i thought somebody was just out in the woods man <laughs> like like uh do it doing a very inefficient uh fur trapping 
Yeah. So that's, uh, that's a hell of a trapper. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, they were, they were, these were like farm minks and apparently they, sadly they killed them off and then they had to mass bury them like a, a, a like ET cartridges. And then they started swelling and then popped up to the surface. And there are all of a sudden these dead minks and it I makes mean, for also, zombie stories. Uh, uh, what kind of mind would think about uh, agitating a corpse so a gullible press would cover it as a resurrection and then launch a multi-book franchise based on it. <laughs> <laughs> no spoilers. No spoilers. Yeah, well, no spoilers for the yeah. first uh, uh, 15 pages of Angel Killer. But uh, uh, oh. <laughs> uh, there, there is uh, uh, certainly... Uh, uh, the, 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 if, if, if you read the opening of Angel Killer and you're like, no, the press would never cover something like this. It's like, well, yeah, they did it with a bunch of minks. They would definitely do it with a dead yeah. woman in Seattle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, horrible, horrible, terrifying story. But um, that reminds me of a story that uh, a friend of ours, remember Jack Latona, uh, Justin may remember him, who of course, yeah. was uh, an attorney, had been a city commissioner in Fort Lauderdale. And when he was city com- when he was one of the commissioners, he got a call one day at his office and his secretary took it. And she says, I got this lady who's calling. She sounds kind of crazy. <laughs> and, and Jack's a very pragmatic kind of guy. He's like, put her through. This woman's on the phone and she says... The dead are coming out of the ground. <laughs> the dead are coming out of the ground. And he's like, oh, lady, what's happening? He goes, the dead, the dead's coming out of the ground. Like, I need somebody. Nobody's going to, nobody was coming by. I've called the police. I've called everybody. Nobody's coming. He's like, well, it's like, you know what? Like, let me be a, let me, let me be a good servant to the people calls the police department and says, can you go buy this address? And it was like a poor area, kind of like a kind of a planned community for like low income that sort of kind of been neglected. They meet this old lady out there. She's like, oh, the dead's coming out of the ground. Like, all right, lady, show us. She leaves them around the back. And in between the buildings is this, you know, this field, this grown over field with trash and litter and human skeletal remains coming out of the ground. Ah! Now, was this a it case where they been, moved the headstones, but they didn't move the bodies? Or was this the case of a horrific even, murder? <laughs> they never put headstones. It was like a pauper's grave. That they're, they're like, oh, where are we going to build the houses for the poor people? I got an idea. And wow. so they built the houses God. right over where the pauper grave had been with no headstones. And then it's erosion and whatnot. And this poor woman's like, hey, uh, dead's coming out of the ground. Can somebody come look at this? Yeah, yeah, whatever, lady. Click. Come on, click, click, click. Finally, Jack's like, you know, you got to look at these things sometimes because sometimes there might be something to it. So. <laughs> that's insane. That's, that's, yeah. uh, geez. Man, well, I'll tell you. Florida. What, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sure it <laughs> happens everywhere, right? Right? Florida mm-hmm. asked lonely. <laughs> One of your picks? Sure. Yeah, I'm suddenly uh, realizing how little content I've consumed. I may need a minute on this. Go ahead, Justin. Yeah, I don't know if I really have much more than uh, we, we've. Uh, uh, of course, we watched the the Mandalorian, um, and then uh, we've continued to watch the Crown. I, I I'll just make it the Crown. I, I, I'll I'll say this. Uh, I don't know if the show likes or hates the people that they're making a show about, but. Uh, uh, there's, there, there's enough there that I, I like it. it every once in a while. It pushes beyond my threshold for how much, uh, uh, I can deal with British procedural drama. Uh, and I mean that in the literal, like they wonder about the procedure for everything, but then there was an episode we watched last night that was basically just about how much of an irredeemable sissy Prince Charles was like from birth. And it was like, borderline on like really mean about like no this child sucks even like compared to other children this guy sucks and i'm like okay well i kind of like that so there we go the crowd that's awesome yeah uh I've, i'm sure we've talked about it previously but uh if you haven't heard we're uh, as a family finally really getting into community man once i heard that it gets good in season two um season one suddenly seems to take way too long for my tastes i mean don't get me wrong i'm halfway through it right now but then i looked 25 episodes in a single season what the what the hot hell is this never, the never, never, gone, never gone era 
Bygone yeah. era. <laughs> what the hot hell is 25 episodes in a single season? Uh, yeah, so we're making it through that first season so that we can get to the fabled second season and beyond. That's a show that, you know, it's set, it starts off with its sort of template of these are our characters, this is who it's going to be about. But once you realize that Jeff and Britta, although great actors, are the least interesting characters on the show, it becomes a better show. You yeah. know, yeah. You know, the yeah. less it's and, about, and, you know, Jeff, super cool guy, Fonzie in community college and more about the misfits. Yeah, it it uh, uh, it it certainly abandons. And I think Dan Herman's even talked about the fact that like their best laid plans of like, OK, well, this is a show about this, like, will they won't they moonlighting thing between Jeff and Britta and also like our great comic relief of the Beavis and Butthead Chevy Chase and Donald Glover that'll keep going back and forth. And then it's like they realize that the acting talent and the the natural direction of the story wanted different things. And to their credit, they 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 took the the show where it kind of more most naturally wanted to be, which uh, is yeah. is good. Yeah, uh, I got a pick. Uh, uh, I also have not been watching much new stuff over the past week, but the thing I did watch after. Uh, much haranguing from some of my friends is uh, maybe the worst titled show of 2020, uh, but it's very interesting and certainly not for everybody. It's called How To with John Wilson on HBO. Uh, this is I I have a I'm going to have a very difficult time explaining this show, so bear bear with me. Okay, it's not a prank show, right? It's not Borat. It's not the Ali G show. It's also not Nathan for You, which is like produced and and really like set up you know you're going they you know a lot of the people know that they're being filmed for something or there's a big project um this is a i guess you would call it a docu comedy where john so john wilson is a documenter and he is doing these each episode is like a video essay you just think of it as like a video essay um but giving himself the freedom to chase random things right so the first episode is like how to make small talk and he's in new york and he's you know it's it's kind of a cutesy like you know sometimes people just need to talk about nothing so that they don't you know talk about real things and then that's then that that makes it makes everyone feel bad or whatever um but uh but there's one person that he talks to just to kind of exemplify how off the beaten path the show is who uh he, uh, I guess they're doing an interview at a, at a wrestling show outside of a wrestling re- wrestling show. And uh, uh, what's the question? Do you think mankind will, will turn it around or something like that? And it was at front of, in front of a big WWE show. So he thought he was talking about the wrestler mankind. Um, and so uh, 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 the guy says, Oh, you mean like people? Oh, uh, uh, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I, I, what does he say? He says, oh, check me out on Facebook. I catch child predators. And so the documentary goes and follows him for a couple of minutes. It goes to his home where he's like trying to set up a child predator sting. And this is just some guy. Uh, so, so that's kind of what this show is. It's, it's, it's quote unquote how to's it's quote unquote video essays. Um, but also just really strange. There's a lot of footage of like, uh, like a lot of really close up footage of like accidents and crime scenes in the middle of it. Um, I, I, I don't know how a good way to describe it. This is not going to be for everybody, but it, is, it leans into some of the stuff you would see in a Borat or a Nathan for you. In fact, Nathan Fielder is an executive producer on the show. So you see a lot of that there, uh, but trying to catch strange and awkward moments and sound bites out of people. Um, uh, while also trying to make a point, right? The second episode is about scaffolding. It's all about scaffolding. And uh, uh, and so, you know, he's talking to people and he's seeing, you know, oh, people in New York who have, like, their views are now obstructed by scaffolding, this thing that's supposed to be temporary. And, you know, he, he talks to those people. He goes to a scaffolding convention in New Orleans 
And spoiler alert for the second episode, he goes and he looks and, you know, he's at New Orleans and he's like, oh, wow, there's not scaffolding everywhere here. And he's even looking at this construction site of the Hard Rock Hotel in New Orleans. And he flies back home and he says, oh, cool. Like two days ago, two, like two days after I was just standing right there at the construction spot, that's where the Hard Rock Hotel collapsed on the street. Oh. <laughs> and it's 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 bizarre. I, I can't uh, say... So, I'm having trouble explaining it because I don't know what this show is, but it's really interesting. And it made me laugh out loud. The two episodes I watched, it made me laugh out loud, just bust out laughing because of either the way it's set up, it's written, it's presented, it's edited. Uh, And it's, it's very weird. It's just very weird. Uh, How to with John Wilson on HBO. So I have a pick, which is a YouTube channel and I had not come across, um, her before. Uh, she's a physicist. Her name is Sabine Hossenfelder, and she does some pretty interesting videos explaining physics and different topics like that. And does a really good job of it. I'm like one of my favorite explainers in general for like space stuff is Scott Manley and then Sabine Hoppenstetter when it comes to explaining general physics concepts. I just, I love it when I could just sit there and feel like, okay, I think I understand this now. Um, she just had a video come up like a week or so ago, which was really cool because there's a paper out on warp drive um, called introducing physical warp drives or which hasn't been formally released yet for peer review but she covers it and she's not she's very smart as far as i can tell i mean it's all above my head but you know she does a really good job of explaining the problem with like the alkyberry drive paper and the issues with that and what didn't settle and she gets into why this this paper makes sense and explains how you could have warp drive without having paradoxes and whatnot her german pronunciations are delightful by the way you know, so to, to hear Einstein said in German sounds very different than the way I say it. But anyhow, I really I've d- watched a few of her videos. I think she's a wonderful explainer. And just you know, one of the things that makes YouTube great is a great resource for learning things. And also, hey, maybe Warp Drive could be a thing after all. So That's pretty rad. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Um, I'll do a little another little pick, by the way, too, because um, you guys sort of skipped on that. Um <laughs> <laughs> the the uh <laughs> for shame gentlemen hey, we uh, had a by, contract by the way, in, in in our defense uh i actually paused for a second and i thought yeah man how weird that all of us haven't been consuming a lot of media is there anything strange about the last week that maybe is a bit out of a oh that's right it was freaking thanksgiving maybe maybe we all weren't watching something maybe some of us worked so we had no place to go <laughs> so uh I've been watching and I haven't I've been watching little increments each night and this is a movie that the cast was too young I would love to have seen this movie made if the stars if they were brought in if they made it 10 years later with the cast when they were 10 years older than the parts they're playing because they look like children nothing against their acting capability whatever but playing characters just felt to me like should be older Valerian and the city of a thousand planets Oh man! Did you ever see that the Luke Besson I film? I think I remember the title of it. That's about it. No, that Which this was, was yeah, this was like uh, uh, independently financed, right? Like this was going to be a big like European centric sci fi uh, uh, thing that was like uh, uh, very much shot on green screen, but uh, uh, then had a troubled production, if I remember correctly. I mean, it's a huge production. You've got Rihanna yeah. in it. You've got a big cast. It was a big, it was a big, big, you know, pretty big movie. And I mean, it's a VFX heavy. So yeah, there's going to be green screens, but it's not a cheap movie by any sense. No, no, it no, is, no. I, I didn't, I yeah. didn't, I didn't mean to, uh, to, to insinuate that more that, yeah, that it was like they were taking advantage of a lot of new technology, but there was a ton of money put into it. Yeah. So, you know, Luke Basson, who did the fifth element, who I think is a wonderful, just a, I love, Fifth Element, right? I think with Fifth Element, it's just such a delightful movie all the way around. So for him to do another big science fiction film, people were excited about it, and it came out, and it kind of like kind of had a hit with a bit of a thud, at least in the United States. And and I think, like I said, I think the cast, uh, the main characters, I think if they'd been a little older, I think it'd be kind of better. I think they're all great actors. But anyhow, the effects, the visuals in the world building, go back and watch it just for that. Go back and watch it for... Luke Basson is throwing everything at you. You know, the, the original comic was Valerian and Laureleen. I don't know why they changed it for, because it's very much about the two of them and to make it Valerian, the city of a thousand planets. I don't understand that title change to take 
the girl's name out of the title. But anyhow, uh, it is an amazingly visual film. And it moves, moves, moves. I don't think it's a great movie. I don't think it's a movie. I don't remember. I thought I'd seen it, but I'm watching like, I don't remember any of this. But it's still, I like Luke Passan. And it's sort of like the Wachowski sisters. It's like, even when they have a misfire, if they throw everything at it, you're still going to go like, well, still something kind of fun here in some way. So... Uh, that's great. Yeah. And, and I, I totally agree with you with the uh, uh, Dean DeHaan and, and Chloe Devaney. Uh, like they are too, like, I, I, I still kind of feel like, the, uh, or sorry, Dane DeHaan. Uh, he, yeah. he got a couple shots in like bigger budget things that just kind of misfired, but he was so good in that. Um, uh, what was the Michael B. Jordan uh, uh, all the kids get superpowers. Chronicle. Chronicle. Yeah, he was great in Chronicle. Um, but yeah, it was like like uh, Amazing Spider Man. He he was, uh, you know, he he got a shot there and didn't re wasn't really able to kind of a uh, uh, sing. But I, I would I would love to see him and other stuff. And Chloe Devaney, I think, is just like a star. She just needs a kind of a, a a vehicle, a different vehicle to sort of push her over the top. Yeah, I was just when I, I wasn't I, like I'm watching. I'm going like, man, like I feel like because they're so youthful and young looking, and you feel like you're supposed to be watching a sort of kind of Daniel Craig esque, <laughs> you know, at his point in life kind of character. So uh, I'd like to see, you know, maybe someday. But anyhow, um, just from the visuals alone, I'm not telling you like, oh, it's, it's movies. The story is super great, it, but it is. It Luke Besson. He wants to entertain you, and he wants to keep things moving, which I really enjoyed. It, so uh, for, for it was sort of like. From what you're saying, like, uh, uh, I don't know, like, uh, uh, I've, I've often pointed out that, uh, to my eyes, Tron is one of the best movies to have on with no audio in the background. And it sounds like this is uh, kind of a similar thing where it's like, like, there are <sighs> visuals and pictures that belong in your brain, and this is the way to get I, in there? I would, no, I think that you want to listen to it, because Tron is slow. Tron is really slow. So if you go back and you look at the pacing of Tron, and it is, I can fall asleep watching Tron. Yeah. And I love Tron, but I, I it's just. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a few, yeah, a few visuals that, that are powerful enough that, that they, you know, 40 years later are still blasted into my brain, mm -hmm. but that's about it. So, yeah, yeah, I think this it, one Andrew, you can the sound on, but. In, in my mind, this movie was kind of tied to Jupiter Ascending as like another big movie that wasn't quite what it should be it borderlining on like Jupiter ascending, I think has kind of slotted itself in as like uh, a kind of an, an, an enjoyable, uh, uh, you know, trash sort of sci-fi film. So it, w where would you put Ju or a, a, a Valerian next to Jupiter ascending? Oh, I, this is way better, way better. Okay. But again, that's not saying much because Jupiter ascending, the problem there was like, you have good actors in really poorly written parts being super melodramatic and you just can't take anybody seriously here. Like there's great action. See, there's some really good action sequences and stuff. And you have things they want to show like, uh, you know, how do you do, you know, uh, an interdimensional marketplace where people put on like special VR goggles and stuff to walk through a desert and go buy things in this sort of virtual world that's somewhere else. Like there's, so many cool, crazy kind of ideas here. And everybody is, all the characters are pretty serious and earnest and whatnot. You get the, 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 the way that the Valerian character sort of described is this, it's way overkilled. I think I'm like, oh, he's this, you know, he just loves all, he's this super lover of women and whatnot. And he's met the right girl. And you're just sort of like, oh, just, just get to the story. But when it gets into the story and stuff, it's fun and visual and stuff where I think that, Jupiter Ascending is just like it's just a silly. It's every. It's you can't watch a single scene of that and not go, oh geez. You I know? mean, yeah. At 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 the moment where there's like a pitched battle and Channing Tatum comes rollerblading in as a dog, you're like, <laughs> well, okay, well, I guess we're watching this movie. Yeah. So, but. It does have neat visuals, and it is Wachowski is doing kind of yeah. visual stuff. But I would say that, like, like if you like Fifth Element, I might go check out Valerian. If Fifth Element's not gotcha. your jam, then you're not going to find anything useful in Valerian. Gentlemen, 
It's been weird. Now, if you'll excuse me, I think a certain seven-acre plot needs a monolith. BRB. <laughs> what? Uh, e. Clay Thompson in the chat says Roma oh, uh, this, this, a very similar-looking monolith has popped up in Romania. Yeah, copycat monoliths. Yeah, it's definitely a copycat. At least the way that this photo looks. It's made of foil. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's got all this dimpling on it that looks... Yeah, yeah. Pretty, uh, uh, it's not even not even a single episode. Somebody's going to create an entire channel to monolith making. <laughs> it's like, yeah. now yeah. a bad monolith, yourmonolithsucks.org is going to be a site. <laughs> How to monolith. Uh, <laughs> I, I I was surprised when when you uh, they were showing the pictures of how uh, of it being gone at how shallow uh, uh, it was it it must have been a heavy ass like monolith if it was just sitting there with like you know only a couple inches deep into the soil same especially if it had been there for several years it's like you tell me that didn't you know ain't no that was ain't like no screwed in nowhere or, knock yeah. it over or something yeah well it was in in that kind of recess of the cliff so maybe that cut on some of the wind yeah and some of the elements maybe, maybe. and maybe. also you know like like justin was saving uh heavy enough you you, you know you could be yeah. pretty un you know tall yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> pop sparky in the chat <laughs> <laughs> all right so we're gonna take a few minutes here and turn around for some after things yeah here i'll grab okay. a sodi water brb all right very cool. Mm -hmm. Hey, Justin. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to Bryce. Hey, Justin. Like how was your Bryce. weekend? Good, man. Good. Good. Uh, what did I work on? Worked on a project. Uh, sat on my roof. Mm. You know. Okay. Like a nice, you know, good roof sit. You know. Got a, got my, uh, my fourth COVID test back today. Ooh. Yep. Clean. Nice. Four for four. Knew you are going to do it. You can't catch me mother effer mm -mm. uh yeah so um uh that was uh that was good a little bit longer on that one because we got that test on monday oh really and you only got that back mm -hmm. on the weekend i need to got get back no this morning this, this morning, morning oh geez we woke up. so yeah. like a um, whole week um i i i need i sh i am overdue to go get a new covid test um the last time i went Last time I went, I went to CVS because they'll do it for free on my insurance. Yep. And uh, I go and I, you know, I'd set up the appointment the day before and I roll up. Uh, and I knew it was a bad sign when someone rolled up in front of me and then left pretty quickly. Uh, they said, oh, yeah, are the computers down? So we can't, you know, print the label or do any of the stuff that we need to do to check you in. So we'll call yeah. you when it's when it's back when up. When it's working. Yeah. Yeah. They did not call me back. And so... <laughs> <laughs> so uh shocker i know so um it's just been uh just seen to set up another appointment yeah i'll tell you what we uh uh had a hard time well we should have probably known that it was going to be a, a a pain in the butt to get mm -hmm. a rapid test before thanksgiving where i think everybody was like whatever give me a rapid test um but uh uh yeah we had uh we went through kaiser our, our insurance provider <laughs> Mm -hmm. And they had a, a drive through thing set up where it was actually super easy. And it was definitely the only time that I've had a COVID test done by a doctor oh. or somebody that was projecting themselves as a medical professional. Otherwise, well, I guess, no, the, the rapid test I did, but, uh, uh, no, 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 no. The rapid test, they, they, they told me to do it myself. They handed me the thing. Yeah. All but mine this, have been this, self done. Yeah. This dude got us in there. Oh really? Oh, he, yeah. Oh, oh he, he went was... in the the sinus stuff too. Because when I yeah, got the rapid, well, no, no, no. <clears throat> or yeah, it, the last time I got a test, I, it was just the inside. You don't go to the sinus anymore. So it was the front of the nose, but this dude was thorough, mm. and so he was a little bit more up the front of the nose than I would have been in in getting it. Uh, and then he was very much on uh, like the back of the, the the back of the throat. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah. He was apparently on that Cardi B hit the dangly thing in the back of my throat. <laughs> hey, you remember that? Yeah. You remember that that was this year? Remember, remember five years ago when when Ooh, WAP was uh, when the teaching the world to sing. <laughs> uh, do you need a break, Justin? No, I'm good. You're good. All right. Uh, KB, uh, you guys want to do some after things? 
Yeah. Yep. Sure. Okay. Well, I'm going to catch you in for after things in three, two. Hello, and welcome to After Things. I'm Adrian Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Yeah, yo, actually, should we, uh, we? We had a significant drop off in the middle of that. Could, I was going to edit it, but now we, oh. should, now we should restart. Oh, okay. It. <laughs> sorry, sorry. It was big enough that I that I didn't think it was editable. No, we, yeah, we edit those. Okay, we, we clean those up. All right, let me catch you in one more time. Here we go. In three, two. Hello, and welcome to After Things. I'm Adrian Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, Mr. Justin Robert Young. Well, hello. Gentlemen, let's talk about After Things during the After sure. Things show, which is what we do every time. And I am speaking of which it's the end of November, it's almost December, and we have a whole new year ahead of us. Knowing what you know about the world, life, everything, what are you planning to do differently or the same next year? Ooh, man. Uh, that's a, that's, that's a good question. Uh, was that off? Uh, did, nobody sent that in, did they? Okay. All right, cool. I just did from well, my oh, heart. Okay. No, yeah. no, it was, it was just so good. That it, writing it made in, think... writing in, emailing <laughs> Andrew Maine's heart says, uh, man, uh, I, 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 I suppose, uh, I suppose I most certainly am going to be more cautious about having, uh, about setting stuff aside. And I think the whole world is. I, I think that even if you have done a pretty good job of surviving the uh, surprise train wreck of 2020, uh, and even if things are looking good in terms of vaccines, and, and let's say, you know, as soon as, you know, a few months in, it, they start becoming widely available. Um, and even if you're at a point where your personal sales numbers, whatever your metrics are that you go uh, for yourself, I feel like everybody's going to be squirreling uh, some extra something aside uh, and, and, and just playing it safe for all of 2021. Does, does, does that sound accurate to you, Justin? Um, I don't know. I haven't thought of it like that. I, uh, I've, uh, I actually, in my little uh, uh, week that Ashley and I spent being in a tinier room than, but a different room than we had been in all year uh, in San Diego, I took like a day to lay out my kind of next year and what I wanted to do. And so this is going to be the first time where specifically, at least on a production calendar i've laid out what i want to do i'm i'm uh i think if there's one thing that this lockdown has given me it's it's a lot more foresight and uh a faith in myself that in giving myself time and planning that my my output can be better so i'm um, i'm looking at it right now of like i i set like deadlines for the end of each quarter and I have things that I want to do. I have metrics that I do want to hit in terms of uh, the weekly podcast, but uh, uh, I've, I've, I've tried to kind of give everything sort of a new gloss of, of, of paint over the last few weeks based on my uh, uh, thought process there. Uh, uh, but, but yeah, I, I think I am like, I'm very, very dialed into exactly how I am going to attack 2021 with the idea being that let's say everything stays as locked down as everything has stayed, then I'm rocking and rolling. I am only guided by the stuff I can control. If we wind up taking off, boy, I got some cool ideas on the back burner that I would love to spin up, but I'm it, the lesson of 2020 to me has been don't count on it, whatever it is, just don't count on it. Focus on everything so that you have right in front of you. I want, I want Bryce to answer this question too, but I want to throw out a thing to think about for everybody here is, do you know what next year is? 2021. The Olympics, which the 2020 is, Olympics. Uh, wait, which, 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 you, oh, no, uh, uh, which is uh, what? I give up. The actual start of the next decade. Oh, <laughs> that's a, <laughs> that discussion. Fair point. Fair uh, point. Uh, uh, I'd say the perennial favorite, but I guess it's the millennial favorite. No, but I mean, like, I know we go, oh, no, it's no, it's legit. 2021 is the start of the next decade. And if, so framing it from that point of view. Yeah. If we're ever going to sell that, now's the time. 
Now is the time I think we can all be on board. You want to know when the decade really starts? New Year's Eve, this uh, uh, coming up at the end of this coming month. Yeah, we could leave this decade behind. Bye. Start decade. No, fresh decade. Oh, but there's a virus. Oh, yeah, but there's a cure for the virus. Oh, okay. I'd rather be in that yep. decade. Mm -hmm. where there's you know mm -hmm. you know cures and stuff but but it is but as a framing device kind of thing though i like to it. think about like hey you know that is we are going and we are barking in the next decade which is what does that mean bryce what does that mean for you <laughs> uh uh i i really don't know uh this 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 year i think with all the covid stuff uh i was definitely powering through it better at the start of covid i was an early i was an early resilient person and now i'm starting to un unravel here in in this in this part of in this chapter of it um so i'm i'm really trying to i'm just trying to make it through trying to make it to december <laughs> 2020 wait uh, yeah. uh, uh that's that's uh six, that's in, 16 hours that's right 16 that's right <laughs> and he is white <laughs> and i'm trying white so <laughs> um uh, uh you know i've got a few personal goals for 2021 um you know pers personal stuff right like uh i had Right, right at the start of 2020, I had started getting into fit to, to fitness a little bit and and dieting and, and eating right and making sure to have a have a variety of exercise and stuff. And all of that <laughs> came crashing down in the middle of April. Um, so trying to get back on on some of that wellness stuff, physical and mental wellness um, uh, and, and 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 taking it from there. Um, uh, cause, cause I don't know. I, I, I already kind of do, do a lot of stuff here. So, uh, you know, either keeping an open mind to, uh, I don't know, evolving different things or I, I, I don't exactly know. Um, I'm, I'm just trying, I'm playing it by ear. I got to play it by ear right now, I guess. I think that this last decade, we've seen a lot of cool stuff come about, you know, electric cars are a, like a real cool thing and not something you laugh at anymore. You look at we're gone with, you know, of course, SpaceX and rockets and stuff we've seen, but a lot of stuff has stayed the same too. Is that like, you know, YouTube, YouTube was there before this decade, uh, social networks and Facebook were there before and the rise to prominence happened in this decade. But a lot of this decade sort of was watching things that existed before kind of more fully develop and, seeing the effects of those but i think we've talked about like i don't think there was anything in the last 10 years that if you went to somebody 10 years before and showed them they would be like oh my god i can't believe that you know you'd be like yeah no like i i i, I could see in 2008 where 2000 what 2018 would probably look like and a lot of it, i think we would have thought we would have had sooner vr and stuff i think this next decade is going to be not like that I think by the end, I think by the, you know, 2030, we're going to look back at what happened in the last 10 years and say, holy cow, uh, so much has happened. So many of the things we talked about now, Starship, AI, robotics, you know, VR, biotechnology, the acceleration, I think it's going to happen to medicine, et cetera. I think the next 10 years is going to be a rapid, is going to be a rapid pace of things happening. Yeah, um, and, and, and I guess specifically, obviously, we're super interested in it, so we tend to gravitate to, to those stories. But, um, man, how like, think about, I can't, I, I, can, I can only, you probably know, Andrew, how many SpaceX launches happen per year now. Uh, and, and I've tried to imagine how many uh, orders of magnitude it will have gone up. Uh, uh, I mean, at least, at, at least, you know, if, hundreds th thousands of flights a, a year tens of thousands of flights a year think about think about like they're going to try to do starship by the way they're going to try to send that up to 15 kilometers this this week okay and meanwhile and and, and not always you know, we talk about spacex a lot there's other companies blue origin there's other companies working on other stuff and that's kind of the exciting thing is other players coming to play there but when you have Starship, a fully reusable rocket, if it works, a fully reusable rocket that literally just fuel it up, send it up again, 
you're already getting a lot of big, we have a really big launch cadence now of Falcon 9 rockets. I can't keep track of them because it feels like sometimes there's every few days there's a Falcon 9 launch. With Starship, you're going to be like every day, every other day or something, this thing's going to be going up. And that's going to be kind of mind blowing to think. And as they start building more of these and it's going to become sooner than later and by the end of the decade, what does the world look like? But even on another end of stuff too is that I think that one of the things we've seen is sort of the idea of thinking outside the paradigm of like, we've, we've done things sort of the same way for a long time. And finally you're having to make bigger bets to try things differently, which I'll give you an example is Apple with the M one chip and them switching from an 86 architecture to arm, which may not mean a lot, but the idea that somebody would be using arm processors on the desktop you know, seemed kind of crazy several years ago. But then if you looked at, if you show this chart of ARM processors and 86, you'd see 86 was much more overall powerful and had this sort of, you know, slight rise, but ARM kept going doom, doom, doom. And there's this point where ARM processors just outpaced 86. Yeah. And Apple was like, yeah, no, we should probably be using this now. And other people like, ah, oh, but we've used this before. But Apple's like, no, we think so. Then we're going to spend billions of dollars to make this thing happen. And we had this sort of plateau. You notice that like we had this kind of Moore's law, but sort of this plateau of where processors were going. And all of a sudden they're getting faster again because you know, you had to make a bet on something different. And I think that's going to apply to other stuff, I guess. Is it, it maybe medicine, maybe other areas too, where people are gonna say, there is this other thing that we kind of was given sort of notional improvements, but it wasn't as good as this thing. Maybe we throw a bunch of money in there. It could be solar panels. I don't know. I just think we're gonna see a lot of that in this next decade. Uh, I, I I definitely think that in in this next decade we're going to see a ton of change in terms of our media landscape, in terms of of how we interact with each other, what we go to for information, and uh uh you know I've I've long said that kind of like social media is a very we are still in an awkward adolescence, and I certainly hope that we are at you know our we are we are at a point with social media where we've we've uh crashed the family car and now we have to come to grips with the fact that we're adults and we need to have personal responsibility uh, uh because we can't just keep lashing out the way that a child does but uh, uh even in terms of the institutions the media institutions for which have kind of been the bedrock of what we understand to be uh you know the the, the gathering places of information a lot of that's going to change. You know, uh, the one thing that the lockdown kind of brought, and this might be the kind of like, the lockdown might be the London fire that allows us to build a a better, more modern society. But it jumped all of our, uh, a, a lot of trends just kind of jumped ahead like five years in a year. And te uh, uh, technology was certainly one of them. The concept of, streaming and con video conferencing and, and where you need to live to be in a place where it where it matters is very very different today than it was even in february but also the ad market fell apart you know the things that were kind of uh, on schedule to change changed way faster than uh, i think anybody was kind of planning on it and now we're entering into a world where you know we got some decent ideas on what happens next you know in terms of direct funding it's it's i'm happy to be on patreon and and have done this kind of stuff for a little while now but i think you're gonna see a lot of that you're gonna see a lot of uh uh kind of really uh and i think uh meaningfully exciting things that will happen throughout media and culture over the next 10 years that I think we saw maybe a tremor of in the early aughts with like blogs and RSS and podcasts and stuff like that. But that was like, I think a, a tremor Th that was happening on the outsides of the walls while these gleaming uh, uh, media organizations kind of stood at the center. Now I think we are at a full leveling where there's going to be a lot of crazy money going into a lot of crazy places. It's going to be rad. You think, uh, I, I, I suppose, Part of that is uh, we're definitely seeing a lot of people 
uh, get a lot more comfortable with the idea of actually paying for their media and paying attention to their media diet and what kind of biases. Uh, like, I, I don't know that there was a whole lot of talk 10 years ago about outside of the general, the media's bias to the left. That was just the, that, that was all anyone seemed to be able to say. But now it's like there's, uh, I use the ground news app and I really dig the fact that, that, some version of everything that I'm consuming, I, you know, I recognize I'll, I'll read a, you know, biased right source, and then I'll go read a biased left source. And then, and nowadays we're a lot more comfortable. We have lots of stories about people who have left big institutions to go be directly funded. And the idea of, of paying for your information 10 years ago would have been anathema. Everybody felt entitled to everything free, but nowadays it's, it's almost as though, consuming free information um i i think with social media we're getting to that point where uh, social media is cigarettes and and more people are acknowledging that like uh the other day bonnie had to take a phone call and then like 15 minutes later i walked outside and she was still there and she snapped her phone away and i'm like what's what's going on sweetie and she goes I was smoking like she just full on <laughs> admitted that she got caught up in just scrolling through that Facebook feed. Uh, and I think we're getting there of stigmatizing free social media for, for the downside. You know, if you're not paying for it, then you're the product. And I think we're going to move farther that way towards, you know, just uh, free uh, periodicals are going to become informational junk food where it's like, hey, man, I ain't going to blame you. Sometimes you're hungry and then fries look good. But we all know you should be eating a healthy meal. Well, but but also think about it like this. Uh, there was a sea change in culture the moment people, the moment that you could have a conversation with your parents and say, I bought this book on Amazon, right? In fact, I remember back at South Plantation High School talking to Andrew Maine uh, uh, and saying, and him saying, yeah, I did all my shopping on Amazon this year. Like, and, and it was like, oh, wow, that's crazy. Now it's social proof that you would put your <laughs> credit card on the internet, right? Uh, that is a sea change. Whether or not we realize it's like, no, no, I'm getting a new book. No, you're not. You, you just trusted your credit card on a website and that has now become a thing that you do. You're, you're, you're a rube if you don't give Amazon trust in your credit card. Same thing happened with Apple and music. Now all of a sudden you trust your credit card there. The fact that we are now in a situation that like Patreons come of age, uh, a lot of, of, of different places that have hit a lot of different areas. Now, uh, uh, PayPal, Venmo, all these different ways that we interact with money. There's, there's now just a, a table setting for stuff like this in, in, in the future. And it's like, whether or not we have the will to think, well, this sucks or it's biased or I don't like this or I would like to support this. The the playground of, okay, now all these other places are discoverable and I think it's a cool thing to do to pay for it. Like there, there are a lot of things that have to change beyond the will. And I feel like we're kind of there now. And then also the big, you know, quote unquote, easy money from from ads is kind of receding which means things are about to get very weird i think the thing that i'm hopeful for is if you take a look at some of the top podcasts and 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 you're going to see people who are you're going to see people with certain points of view both sides whatever but a number of the top ones like you take let's say like joe rogan Joe Rogan will have anybody on his podcast. You could be anywhere in the spectrum and Joe Rogan will have you on his podcast, right? And even some of like, I've seen even some of the conservatives, like I've watched them sit down with like Eric Weinstein and stuff. And he explains like why you need social safety nets and stuff. And I see that and I see these really healthy discussions between people who have very different viewpoints. And I'm hopeful as we see that, you know, the number one podcast is Rogan. And you could you can be a Marxist and go on there. You could be far right. You could be you could be you know the crazy conspiracy theory kind of person, and he'll have you on there, which frustrates people. But the point is, people like to watch that show or listen to him because they're getting a variety of opinions. They're getting this variety of this thing, and that used to be something we used to see more of on the news. We used to be able to you know somebody showed a clip of like uh uh um. Uh, 
Carlin sitting next to Ann Coulter on the Jay Leno show. And yeah. there's no version of that that would exist today besides the fact, you know, Carlin's passed away. There's no version of that would exist today. There's no version of that. And I think that we're less healthy for it because you want people on the right to listen to people on the left. You want people on the left to listen to people on the right and people in the middle to have an opportunity to be heard or whatever. And I think from a political point of view, I think that's polarized us. But I'm hopeful by the fact that I think most people are kind of cool with hearing opposing points of view. But the platforms haven't been. The platforms have tried to be more polarizing. And to Justin's point about where the media is going to, I think that's the hopeful thing, is that is that you're going to feel okay for listening and liking somebody who's different, thinks differently than you do and has different ideas than you do, but you're going to enjoy their content and be open to hearing from that. That's my dream, at least. I, I think it's but. a beautiful dream. It's a dream I share. <laughs> I mean, I, but that's I want it, it to was, be more than a yeah. dream. I want it to be the real world. No, I think, but I think that's where we're, I think it's not going to happen with regular cable news. It's not going to happen on network for sure. And I, but I do think that it's going to happen in, because those places often, they get so locked in, oh, well, this is who our audience is and we can't go outside of the box here and do this. Well, other places are more like, can be a little more risky and take bigger risks. And And I think try to like, you know, bring way different points of view in and and like i like listening to different points of view i like a well put you know argument i like to hear i want i want there to be more depth than a cartoon characterization of something that i don't think makes sense yeah i think a uh, lot of people uh, and, like that and I, I i i think between delivery delivery being flattened out you know and this was kind of the dream of blogs right was that like oh okay well the New York nytimes.com is a website the same way that Gawker is a website. And so that flattens everything out. And to a certain extent, what the failure of blogs, uh, at least the blog revolution, as it was kind of envisioned in the aughts, was that people realized that being the New York Times is actually really hard. Like everybody can complain about it, but sustaining a media entity is difficult. Like it is, it is really hard to do. And a lot of the most shining examples got over their skis and capsized. Uh, what happens now is like, okay, we'll forget even blogs, everything, having a website. Now, how do you learn of a story where the noise is so loud? Right. And, and now do we even look for stories? Do we now just kind of slot into our own ecosystems and just rely on recommendations on where we hear uh, uh, different things. And if that's the case, then we have totally flattened out the advantages of, of the pillars of old media. Like now well, I, I would say, yeah. Oh, yeah. I say, and the problem that old media had too, was that New York times could stand by their guns and say, yes, we ran an op-ed that's you don't like, but that's why it's called an op-ed years ago and not have an issue because it, it was really hard to cancel it. It was really hard to cancel your subscription when you're getting this print newspaper and whatnot. But in the age of like, no, I'm angry, unsubscribe, you know, angry, cancel my subscription. That changed the way they reacted. That changed the yeah. way they behaved. And I think there will be a price. I think there's a price to be paid for that when you become so beholden to who your audience is that they won't even entertain, you know. Things and, outside and, the and I would also say it's overreaction. It, it, it's the idea of like, okay, well, if you're the main character of Twitter for one day, which, uh, uh, as Bryce explains to us, you never want to be the main character of Twitter uh, for any amount of time, let alone a yeah. day. Uh, and I, I can understand that it's like for if you're a major news outlet and you see that and your staff sees that and now they're reacting to it, then it's like, ah, we need to change. And I think that now as we go forward, you realize that there's a main character on Twitter every day and it's awful yeah. it's terrible to be that person it's terrible to live in that world but it's also not the end of the world at the end at the end of the day mm. all these things although i i agree with brian it oftentimes specifically in the doom scrolling mm. element of it it is harmful to yourself it is just a free message board right like you could just leave the message board you know it's it's not the end of the world Uh, what do you say we do uh, uh, picks? I think uh, Andrew uh, has had to uh, has had to leave, but um, oh sure, uh, Brian, do you have a do you have a pick? Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I guess so. Um, I, I have been consuming some stuff. Um, 
lately I, I found myself getting excited for um, a bit of a surprise for me. Uh, the, the, the Soho Forum Debates uh, is a podcast put out by, by Reason, and it's, uh, I believe, supported by the Reason Foundation, and um, they used to do it live. It's Oxford-style debates, so you uh, they take a poll on an issue before they, they have a proposition. Uh, everybody votes, whether they're for it, against it, or haven't decided, and then they have highly qualified individuals give a really good back-and-forth debate uh, moderated by uh, Gene Epstein, uh, and he... Um, uh, and then at the end, you you know you, you vote again. You see who swayed the needle. And what I love about it is the the subjects are so highfalutin that oftentimes I I have my opinion. But man, is it fun to hear a counter argument where it's like, you know what? That's that's a fine thought, and I don't know that it sways me away, or maybe it does, or whatever. But it's like I I'm very thankful. I don't think I've heard an entire episode where there wasn't at least one point. Either, either from the side I'm inclined to agree with or the side that I'm uh, inclined to uh, decide against that isn't new to me, that I hadn't encountered before and wasn't very well reasoned. Uh, I like it a lot. That's red. Nice. Bryce? Uh, if we're suggesting podcasts, um, uh, uh, here's a podcast. Uh, I really enjoy a show uh, called What a Time to Be Alive. Um it is uh, a comedy show. It's it is kind of actually similar to uh, uh, two weird things in that it is kind of a uh, weird news of the week uh, show. But uh, every week they talk down uh, the five top news stories that make you say the thing. That's the name of the podcast, which is what a time to be alive. So uh, I think it's really fun. Uh, Patty, Eli, and uh, Kath are a really funny crew, which I think is really important on a you know a comedy conversational show like this. So. Uh, that's uh, that's my recommendation. What a time to be alive. Nice. Justin? Uh, I got a recommendation, a story recommendation for people to read. Ooh. Uh, I uh, am obsessed with Matt Drudge and the website The Drudge Report. Uh, I, I think it is a, 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 a seminal internet, early internet settler. He is an early internet settler that really kind of like helped to radically change humanity. He's a very interesting, mysterious character. And in a article on tabletmag.com, there is a great uh, deep dive into whether or not he has, without fanfare, sold the Drudge Report. And uh, uh, now they are just coasting off whatever is uh, uh, whatever money is going to come in. But some longtime uh, uh, readers of the Drudge Report have noticed that it has sort of shifted its uh, ideological tone. It certainly is updating less frequently. There are a lot of, because nobody knows anything and nobody's talking, there's a lot of conversation on whether or not this is just kind of a cash out, that there's a, there's a deep dive into the shadowy world of a uh, web advertising traffic uh that i think is fascinating but i would like everybody to read it because this friday on the politics 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 podcast we're going to be talking with the author so uh not Ooh. only did i very much enjoy the article but i hopefully everybody will enjoy the conversation i have with the author that'll air on friday very cool that's awesome uh well for uh and Maine, uh what do we say it's been after you're damn right it has. Hey, good stuff, everybody. All yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna be back here. Uh, you guys. Uh, you guys gonna be back in about an hour for yeah. our happy hour. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and then we'll have Cord Killers at a uh, six central. Jenny Josephson, I believe, will be our guest today. Yep. So that'd be pretty nice. fun. Uh, and then uh, yeah, night attack tomorrow. So, uh, everybody, thanks yep. for hanging out with us. We'll cool. see you tomorrow. See you in a blink. Bye. Yeah, baby. Later.